Сан байсаг нөх хүн төзгчтэй. Өнөөдөр мана де факто нэг төрүүлгийн зочноор Лондонгийн Imperial College сургуулийн газрын гадар гууны шинжилгээ хухаан болон инженерингийн факультет а түүний цотор уул уурхайн сургуулийн захирал профессор Ян Силье гэж хүн оролцож байна. Лондоны Imperial College-ийн байгаль явахын инженерийн сургууль эрхлэгч. Ашигт малтамлын хөвлөн байж болох технологи, ашигт малтамлын эдийн засаг, ашигт малтамл боловсруулах, олборлох чиглэлээр судалгаа явуулдаг. Rio Tinto компани ашигт малтамлын судалгааны төвийн захирлаар ажилладаг. 2005 оноос хойш Imperial College-д ажиллаж байна. 2001 онд Manchester-ийн сургууль бизнесийн удирдлагын мастер зэрэг хамгаалсан. 1909-1994 онд Cape Town их сургууль багшилж байсан. 1981-1986 онд Wheat Water Strand их сургууль Baclaver Master-ийн зэрэг хамгаалсан. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, please tell us about the uh, general tertiary education system in the country and the, your school position inside. Well, can I first say that how, how pleased I am to be interviewed by you. It's a, a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be here today. Um, if we look at the general education system in the UK, we've got um, primary education in, in primary schools and then secondary education in secondary schools. Um, and there's a, a wide range of schooling there, um, some private schools and some public schools. And these, the children then apply to go to universities of their choice. Um, they, they pick five universities to go to, and there's a, a large number of universities in the country, um, and in the hundreds, um, all of different quality. And uh, the top three really are Imperial College, London, uh, Cambridge, and Oxford. Um, and then there's a there's there's what's called the Russell Group universities, which are include those three, and um, probably another 20 or so of the, the top universities, and then there's a second tier and a third tier be below that. Um, but they all have their own levels of expertise, things that they specialise in, and so um, one can't really um, compare all the universities equally. So it's a it's a your uh, your particular uh, college is has a lot to do with. Uh, Queen Victoria at that time. Can you tell a little bit about the brief history of the college? Yes, it's a very interesting history. Um, the Great Exhibition of 1851 was held in London um, and it made an enormous profit in those days of, of £20,000. And um, Queen Victoria and her husband, um, Prince Albert, or the Queen's consort at that time, bought this enormous piece of land on which Imperial College rests. Uh, and decided to turn it into a, a region for education and learning and culture. And so they built on this the Royal Albert Hall, which you, you may have seen earlier today, which is a, a, a concert hall. There's the Victoria and Albert Museum. There's the Natural History Museum, the Science Museum, and Imperial College is part of that whole, um, what's called Albertopolis, a whole region that was developed as part of the 1851 exhibition legacy. Originally, what kind of schools were within that college? Well, um, Imperial College is uh, just over 100 years old, um, but some of the colleges that made up the, the, or the schools that made up Imperial College, there were three originally. Uh, one of those, and the one you're in today, is called the Royal School of Mines, and that started to, its existence in 1850. Um, so just over 150 years old now. Um, and how many students, faculty today do you have? At Imperial College, we're a relatively small university in, um, in UK terms, but that's because we're very specialized. We only do science, engineering, medicine, and a small business school. School of Mine, please tell us about your tradition, where you have started to play a significant role uh, in the mining industry for this country. Well, the School of Mines, um, traditionally in, in the early or middle 1800s, was established to produce graduates and produce um, technical people for the mining industry across the whole empire, the whole British Empire. Now, of course, as time has changed and the empire has shrunk, um, the role of the School of Mines has changed as well. And so we don't produce mining engineers anymore. We don't really produce minerals engineers anymore because um, as the empire has shrunk, so um, the United Kingdom is no longer really a mining country. But what we are very strong in is finance. So that is what the UK does, is, is finance for mining. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our graduates go into the finance world, they go into the, the financial city, um, but also we still produce a, a large number of undergraduates that are geologists and geophysicists, and they work in the oil industry, the mining industry, um, and in a, re 
in environmental services and a whole region of other services like that. Uh, in this structure, what do you do in your team do in terms of uh, processing or extracting mines? Well, of course, in the um, on the postgraduate region, we do enormous research here, and, and Imperial College is a research-led university. That is what we do. That is our key strength. And the second key strength we have is that we work with industry, extremely well with industry. So our research is very much industry-focused to improve the science and the engineering of industrial processes. So my team here are very involved in mining, we're involved in mineral processing, and how we extract the minerals from the rocks that are mined. And that's our speciality. Um, in my team. And how do you do that? Well, if, if I can uh, explain the whole process, the miners mine the rock, and the rock contains a very small percentage of valuable metal. Yes. So, for example, a copper mine, the new copper mine in, in Mongolia, or Yutolgoi, for example, the rock would contain maybe half a percent of copper, which is very small. That's in a mineral, so it's still copper and iron and sulfur together. So maybe 2% of the rock is valuable, 98% is not valuable at all. Probably. And our job is to separate the valuable material from the, the waste rock. That 2%. And the, you met, you, the first step is to make a concentration, how do we call it? That's right, to make a concentrate. And that's what my team does. So the first stage is to break the rock very finely so the minerals can be separated. Yes. And the second stage is to do that separation. Now, that separation is done in a, a, what's a process called froth flotation, and it's a process where the minerals are separated on the basis of whether they w would rather be in the air, in the gas phase, or in the liquid phase. So we expose them to a gas, they attach to the bubbles, and they float to the surface, and overflow as a froth. That's the process now of uh, concentrator in Mongolia. That's correct. And so this froth that overflows um, uh, contains the What's valuable the liquid particles. liquid inside? Just water. So water with some chemicals added. But this water is recycled? Absolutely, yes. We, we realize that water is a very scarce commodity in many of the places where we mine in the world, yeah. in, uh, in Chile, in America even, and especially in Mongolia. And so we have an enormous recycling capacity capability that we take very careful care of, of the water usage. Okay, Professor, before we go a little bit deeper, you have a wonderful book. Tell us about the book. <laughs> I'm very pleased you asked about it. Um, this, this book is called Dairy Metallica. Okay. It is from, um, the original is from 1556, and it's the first textbook in the West of the mining industry and mining technology. Um, and you'll see it's got beautiful woodcuts in it, that, uh, that show the technology as it was 500 years ago. Wow, and who printed it first? Well, first, as I say, it was printed in Germany, um, and, but then in, uh, and never was translated from the original Latin. Uh -huh. And then in 1911, um, Herbert Hoover, yes. um, the same Hoover who then became president of the United States, translated this into um, English uh -huh. um, with the original woodcuts. And, uh, and this is the book I have, I have here. And you have a signature of his. I do. I'm very proud of this copy. Please show us the because it has, uh, design. Because it has the, the signature of Herbert Hoover um, and this, this wonderful title page that, um, that shows his name and his wife's name. And they were both scientists. Um, and and uh, this is the president who made this Hoover Dam big uh, water dam in, uh, in Nevada. E exactly the same. Exactly the same. And interestingly, he was a, a mining man. Uh, and in Mount Isa Mines in Australia is a statue to Herbert Hoover for his services to mining. And yet this technology that he translated from Latin, which originally made in 1650, uh, 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 that technology is still, that's what you are doing now. I'm, um, well, I'm happy to say that flotation is the one technology that is not in this book. <laughs> so at least that is relatively new, okay. but much of the technology we use in the mining industry yeah. is, is described in this book. So then uh, when you in the mining industry start to use flotation technology? Flotation is relatively new, as I say. Um, for mining, very new. It's only 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was discovered because somebody was washing a miner's clothes, mm -hmm. um, and the, the foam on the top contained the the metallic particles, and, and they involved. thought, oh, we can turn <laughs> this into a process. Yeah, so. uh, how they were extracting it before? Before it was, um, the, the rocks were so heavy in mineral that they could simply go um, separate them either by gravity concentration or by simply looking at them and then going straight to smelting. Mm. Uh, but nowadays we need to do a processing stage in the middle to, to make a concentrate before we can smelt.
So uh, back to are you told uh, when now the concentrator there is the product of concentrator comes with how many uh, in percent of uh, copper? Um, probably about twenty five percent copper. Mm -hmm. Um, it's still in a mineral, so probably about 75% valuable mineral, 25% waste rock still, mm -hmm. because the separation isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. But that concentrate is rich enough in copper and in sulfur now that we can smelt it. And smelting is the next stage of the process. Yes. Uh, that's the separate conversation in Mongolia now keeps going on. Inside of that 25% of uh, concentrate, do we see, because there's also gold there, this is, uh, how many percent would be the gold? Oh, a very, very small percentage, but because it is so, so valuable, mm -hmm. um, it's very... It, it's it's a worth of extracting, absolutely, right? Absolutely. So then let's go, uh, though we have not yet done, but that's the negotiations with the government that down the road we need to make a smelter there so that we have more value-added product in Mongolia. How does it work? The concentrate is um, still a mineral, so it contains sulfur and iron and the copper, and then some bits of gold and some other waste minerals as well. So the, the next stage is to, to take a high temperature, to make a high temperature process, which is now a chemical process rather than a physical process, which was the separation. Just before. burn them? Just burn them. So, well, just burn them, but uh -huh. we, we essentially burn off the sulfur. That becomes sulfur dioxide. Uh -huh. We capture that um, so we don't cause pollution. Uh -huh. The, the whole um, system melts, so the iron oxidizes, that forms a layer that floats on the top, uh -huh. called a slag, okay. that we discard, and then below remains the copper. And that is impure copper at this stage, okay. and it contains a bit of iron, a bit of gold, all kinds of other things. Uh -huh. And then we take that, we cool it down, and then in the, the next process we, we purify that. Mm -hmm. And during that purification stage, we recover the gold as well. As well. Are that purification process, uh, is it separate plant? How does it work? It's a small plant uh, because by now the volume has reduced tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, but how that works is with electrical current, uh -huh. we um, dissolve the metal and we electroplate it again. Uh -huh. And so it's a, and, and copper is, comes out very pure in that process. Mm -hmm. And everything that isn't copper falls into the bottom of the tank, mm -hmm. including the gold and the silver and everything else, and we can collect it quite easily and, and purify it later With on. their own process of separation of e each of them. Exactly, yes. And then uh, when we have a pure uh, copper, let's say, if you compare the whole flotation plant and that, the, the, later on, the smelter, I mean, price-wise, how you would compare cost-wise, how much investment would need if you, if you know the investment in a smelter is, is enormous. There's a, a huge capital investment, and I, I don't want to put a figure on it, mm -hmm. but it is significant. Mm -hmm. um, not only because of the equipment, which is very, uh, very big scale and very specialized, but also because of the associated technology in cleaning up the gases that are produced, mm -hmm. in uh, making sure that there's a, a very low environmental load on this, on this smelter. This sulfur is also caught separately? Yes, it is. And used for what? What, what do we we'll do with that? We, call, we catch it by uh, cleaning up the gas with water, and it forms sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. And then that sulfuric acid can be used in chemical processes, yeah. in rubber processes, and things like that. It requires quite careful handling. The sulfuric acid? Not, not that careful, and also, uh, but that is what we do. You know, that is, uh, that's what professional engineers do, so it's, it's, no, it's not a very dangerous um, However, process. that would be a base of, say, chemical industry for that country. Exactly. Whoever is doing. Exactly. It would be the basis, it could be the basis of a, of a chemical process somewhere else. Um, also, that could be, if, if, um, if we use a different extraction technology for the copper, uh, we can actually use that sulfuric acid to extract the copper from, additional copper from the mine as well. Hmm. Professor, you, this school is one of the best schools in the world of uh, mine and uh, surface science and engineering. How do you measure your performance? Well, we, we are measured um, every five years. There's a big research assessment exercise. We're going through that at the moment, actually, where every department in the country and every academic is, is measured and compared against each other, and there's a ranking that comes out on that. Um, so that will happen in the next year inside the UK. And then the question is how do we rank ourselves internationally? Well, it's a bit unfair to rank yourself, so this is done independently again. The Times... Um, the Times Newspaper does that, for example. Other newspapers do that. But there's also an independent international ranking 
uh, a number of those, one, um, some from China, there's one called the QS rankings, and in general, Imperial College fits in easily in the top 10 of those. Is it something like uh, based on who uh, out of how many students get jobs and what, uh, what term, how long, what salary level, etc., or what? Yes, there's a whole range of criteria. One would be, um, and certainly what's very important to us is what percentage of our students get jobs within six months, what their salaries are, um, but also our research. And our research quality, we believe very strongly, is a very important criterion. So it looks at the quality of the papers that we publish, what journals we publish them in, how many people read those papers, how many people cite those papers, um, how much research income we get, um, who supports us in our research, and those kind of questions. Um, there are also more subtle measures, so for example, um, how many Nobel Prizes has been awarded to your university? And how many? <laughs> From the school? <laughs> From the school, I'm afraid so far none, but we'll, okay. we're working very hard at it. <laughs> Do you have similar schools in the country? Uh, the, in geology we do, yes, we have a, number of, uh, a large number of schools uh, in geology. But I think what's interesting about this particular school is the unique mixture of engineers and scientists. Now, commonly geology is in the science faculty. It's treated as a, a science subject. At Imperial College London, it's an engineering subject. Mm -hmm. So here we have this combination of earth science and earth engineering. Mm -hmm. And our skill and our strength here, that I think it makes us unique, mm -hmm. is that our students learn about the earth, the earth processes, how minerals are formed, how um, the geology works, and that is linked to the extraction of those minerals, the use of those minerals, um, and the same in oil. So we, we do a large amount of work in oil technology as well, so not only mineral technology. So how oil res reservoirs formed, how they um, how they measured, and then how they exploited as well. So this uh, R&D uh, process in this school, in a petroleum part, in copper, in major mines, commodities, uh, who is financing the whole costs? Well, we're very fortunate to be financed um, very well by industry, and of course, it's a two-way process. The more, the better work you do, the better the financing yes. is you get, and and it, that feeds on itself. Um, I'm very fortunate in my group to be working with Rio Tinto. Mm -hmm. Rio Tinto have established a research centre at Imperial College mm -hmm. um, that I lead, um, and it's uh, funded very generously and over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And these are two very important criteria. The first one is that the funding needs to be substantial enough that you can have a critical mass of people mm -hmm. that um, work on a project um, in, to a very deep level. And then the second thing is over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. What is very difficult for many universities and many projects is that they run for maybe three years or four years, the duration of a PhD, and then you have to start again. Whereas the Rio Tinto funding and the Rio Tinto Center has a very long life, um, and that means we can keep our people longer, they, they, the knowledge gets transferred very effectively, and when they graduate, they've got enough knowledge of the company that they go to the company as well. So the knowledge transfer goes not only through technology, but through the people to implement the technology as well. That means your study now, your research now on, I understand, froth flotation, what kind of differences you are going to make in which part of the process? Well, the froth flotation process, I described to you, we have bubbles and the particles stick to the bubbles, and they form a froth on the top. The bit where the particles stick to the bubbles is very much a chemical process or chemical, chemically driven, whereas the separation that we're interested in happens in the froth phase, and that's a physical process, mm -hmm. and there hasn't been, mu been much research on that at all. So my team are uniquely placed in the world to do that work, we build very complex mathematical models of the flow of the froth, the structure of the froth, um, how it behaves, and we measure that industrially as well. So we use the fundamental physics to um, build up a picture of what's going on and then use that to improve the process. Mm -hmm. To manage that particular process where you want to have more yields on. Absolutely, and, and you've put your finger on exactly the right word there, on the yield. When we run a flotation process, typically we lose maybe 10 to 15 percent of the minerals we don't actually collect. Now that's a tremendous waste from um, a natural resource point of view, and we really want to collect as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And just by manipulating the structure of the froth, by doing the research we do, we hope that we can push that yield up maybe two, three, four percent more, get more out of the, the same rock, get mm -hmm. more recovery, and therefore more value to um, both the company but also to the, 
the owners of that resource, the people who own that resource, the country that owns that resource. Uh, how, how, how have you joined this school? From where? Have you been studying here? or? Oh, um, no, my history is, is quite uh, interesting. I come from South Africa originally, mm -hmm. a great mining country, of course. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I come from a mining family. And mm -hmm. so I, uh, I've got mining in my blood, I guess. My father was a geologist in South Africa and, and ran a mining company. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in South Africa. I studied, well, first, before I even studied, I worked underground mm -hmm. on the mines. Um, oh, which mine? I worked on a gold mine called um, Stillfontein Gold Mine when I was a, a young, very young man, <laughs> um, and worked underground and realized I never want to work underground again. I'd rather work on the surface. So I had studied um, minerals engineering at uh, the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. I did my BSc and my MSc degrees in engineering there. Mm -hmm. And then after a few years in industry, I went to Cape Town University and did my PhD there. Mm -hmm and I started my lecturing there and then stayed in academia. I came to the UK mm. and went to Manchester and then eventually from there to, to Imperial College. So is, it, is it hard working here? It is very hard, but it's incredibly satisfying. Mm. Um, there's nothing nicer than being in a team of people or in, a, in a, an environment where everybody is excellent. Mm. Uh, and that's really satisfying. Imperial College is such a collection of excellent people that it that every day is a is is a wonderful day of of new exciting ideas and and excellent people to work with and that's very challenging but also very very interesting students looks like a lot international here they're very international again imperial college very strong on inter international students um, we have about um, about half our students are, are from from outside the UK. It depends a lot on on whether it's po postgraduates or undergraduates. Some departments are higher percentages than others, um, but in general, that's that's about the. So, in general, the Imperial College have consisted today of how many other schools other than mines? Um, there's a. Uh, there are, three, there are four faculties, really. So there's a faculty of engineering, which is where my department of science fits into. Um, then there's the faculty of medicine. There's the faculty of natural sciences mm. and the business school. Uh, wow. And they make up Imperial College. Mm. Uh, which is a larger part of the school? Well, I think the, the school of engineering is, um, or the, the faculty of engineering has got, has got nine schools within it, or nine departments within it, of which mine is one. Um, and then it's about the same size as natural sciences and about the same as medicine again, but the smaller one is, is the business school who, who pretty much sit by themselves, is but a very, a very good business school. Is it hard to enter into your department, your part of uh, earth science and engineering? It is hard to enter into Imperial College altogether. Um, it is one of the top universities in the country, uh -huh. and therefore we take only the very top students, um, uh -huh. both from the UK and from the world, um, and these are really the top students. And it's necessary to, to main, if you want to maintain the standards that we've set for ourselves, mm -hmm. then we demand the very best students, mm -hmm. and the very best students come here and they like to interact with the other very best students, so it, it's a, again, a... How expensive is this school is? The U, uh, interestingly, in the UK, all universities um, have approximately the same fees. Uh, we've uh, recently, the fees have increased, um, and it's about 9,000 pounds a year for undergraduate students from the UK and from Europe at the moment. It is more than that for overseas students because they don't get the subsidy from, from the government. Um, but each department has its own fee structure. Wow, 9,000, that would be about 15,000 US dollar. That's for undergraduates from the UK, and is probably it, uh, double that for Is it for enough students to cover overseas. all costs? Um, it's very expensive to train undergraduates in science and in engineering. That's, that's um, what I mean, in and, medicine. And so, yes, it, there, there has to be some, um, some other funding from other places to, to cover that. And then certainly we get funding from, from the government for each student. Um, and also there's some um, subsidizing of our student activities. Um, again, often companies support us, and Rio Tinto in particular funds, for example, one of our field trips. Our students go into the field to study geology, and Rio Tinto pays for the full cost of that, of that trip. Um, some other companies fund other trips as well. Now, uh, at this time of uh, technology development, IT, what kind of challenges do you face? There are some very interesting challenges, I think, for the higher education sector altogether. Um, what we're seeing is that universities across the world are putting their lecture notes and their lecture courses, they're videoing them and putting them on the internet, pretty much like you put your interviews on the internet. And that means that students can not only 
look at these lectures anywhere in the world where they are, but nowadays they can even take the course and do the examinations and get credit for it. So that raises interesting questions for the future of um, what is the role of the university uh, anywhere in the world and can can one just pick your courses and watch them on the internet? Is that the same as a, as going to university? And I think these things will become, these questions will become more important as time goes by. But I think the role of the university um, as a home for students to get together, to meet personally face to face with their lecturers, to do laboratory experiments, to do field trips, that is the role of the university. It's not only the lectures. Online. Exactly. <laughs> Labs require a lot of investment. They do. And in particular, in the, when you go deeper, it requires more and more. Absolutely. So in terms of that development, how do you see the future of uh, the school from now? We, we're very well placed in that, in that um, region. It's, of course, very expensive. Infrastructure is always expensive. I'll give you an example. We do some very exciting work on isotope geochemistry. So we're measuring is differences in isotopic composition of mm -hmm. seawater, for example, or meteorites that come from space to see what the origin is and to study things like climate change. Yep. Now we're building a new laboratory just to prepare the samples. It's a super clean room, so it has no no dust in it at all. It also has no metal particles in it, uh, no metal um, in it at all either, because it could evaporate and contaminate our samples. That laboratory is costing us two million pounds to construct. Ooh. Uh, by the way, but uh, you said the uh, seawater. When uh, the human can can drink the seawater, when we can extract the real water from pure water from it. Well, we we can already. People are desalinating seawater in the in the Middle East in, in huge volumes. In, and uh, I think the big the big concern there is not the technology; it's the energy required to to desalinate water. In it. So if you can do that with solar power, for example, it's a very good feasible technology. Well, that's great news. Oh, absolutely. In particular for countries like, uh, uh, we're looking I mean, for Gobi Desert in Mongolia, for example. We need water. The people even as outside of water, like the Gulf countries, they still they need water. Absolutely. That's the, the one thing that we can't do without is energy and water. And so um, these are the two major challenges, or two of the major challenges that are facing the Earth. And I think our department here is, is working very hard on um, and Imperial College in general is working very hard on those particular technologies. And of course they're related to the environment as well. So if you take energy, water and the environment, um, then it, it becomes a very interesting picture to put those three topics together sustainably. It's your study, you, all these three topics you consider, right? Including environment. Absolutely, we do. Um, and it's not only the individual topics, but the inter intersection that makes it very exciting. In every field. Absolutely. And I also think that your, your particular background in, in economics it plays such an important role in that as well. It's not only the, the science technology, but the implementation of that, what the result is in internationally in a country or the effect on a country and, and how it affects the world. So these are, are very big questions and very big issues. Very exciting. Professor Schiller, thank you very much for uh, being with us and uh, sharing your thoughts about now and the future of that uh, earth science and engineering. Thank you, Eric. It was a, a pleasure to talk to you and, um, and I must say I'm very proud to be a part of this department and the activities that are going on here at Imperial College. Thank you. Thank you.